Welcome everybody to our last webinar in our springtime series. Today we're happy to have Devin Bertram, the Senior Sustainability Strategist and Project Manager from Stoke, a sustainable real estate services firm based in San Francisco. With a tested background in strategic sustainability action planning, Devin helps organizations define, develop, and implement sustainability programs for their buildings portfolios and align them with their broader strategic goals to achieve impact at sale. As usual, we ask you to refrain from using the chat feature publicly. Please send any questions that you have for Devin to me, Holly Harris, privately via the chat feature. I'll ask the questions for you at the end. Now, welcome Devin. Please start your presentation. Thanks, Holly. Today we'll be talking about, as Holly mentioned, the financial case for high-performance buildings. And a quick agenda about what we'll be talking about. I wanted to share a little about Stoke to give some context of the work we do and why we're interested in this topic. And then looking at what health in the built environment looks like and what that means because uh, as we'll talk about it, it's really a big piece of the puzzle here. And then dive into, last but not least, the business case for high-performance buildings. So a bit about Stoke. Uh, as Holly mentioned, we're a sustainability real estate services firm based in San Francisco, and uh, our purpose is to boldly catalyze an environmentally restorative and socially just world, and we deliver buildings that are healthy, regenerative, and ultimately more valuable. We have three core practice areas within our group, uh, our sustain sustainable design team, which works with single building initiatives and portfolios to integrate technical design and certification consulting. Uh, to really elevate project success, define sustainability goals, and ensure those goals are met. Our project management team uh, works as an owner's rep uh, to ensure that schedule and budget are met from you know, concept to construction and really to ensure that there's an integrated approach throughout all those phases. And last but not least, our engineering and commissioning team, which works to provide uh, seamless management throughout all phases of the life cycle of the project and ensure that optimal performance is met through all those phases. Some quick stats and numbers on Stoke. Uh, we have projects in nine different countries and have worked on over 150 million square feet of uh, real estate globally. Uh, have the privilege um, and opportunity to work with uh, the top five world's most valuable brands defined by Forbes. Uh, there's a crew of 36 dog lovers, a few cat lovers as well, uh, as mentioned, primarily based in San Francisco. We also have uh, an office in Denver and some Stoke representation in LA and Austin. Uh, and we are purpose driven. We really are always looking for ways to, um, you know, not only help support our projects, integrate sustainability into their building projects, but also identify how we could operate our business more sustainably and more aligned with our values. And so through that, we've um, our B Corp, we have a Just Label, we have the world's first impact rated fossil fuel free, gun free 401k, um, are in San Francisco's first net zero energy building, and, uh, and like to operate as we call um, the way nature intended and utilize an organizational biomimicry. And so, um, yeah, are always looking to enhance the way we do business uh, to align with our values as we do the work we do day to day. <clears throat> So I wanted to begin the talk about the financial case for high performance buildings with um, talking about health in the built environment, because as mentioned, that's really a key piece to, um, to the payback and, and benefits. There are a number of areas of opportunity in building design that can impact occupant health and wellness and a real growing body of research on each of them. And actually the, the combinations of them has emerged over the past few decades. And some examples of these areas of opportunity to integrate health into the built environment include uh, thermal comfort, so looking at temperature set points and relative humidity, really creating a comfortable space for the occupant. Uh, ventilation, your source of ventilation, whether that's clean and pure, um, the different rates of ventilation, and certainly air quality, which we're well familiar with, um, looking at the different particulates, what sort of materials are you bringing into the space and what sort of attributes and, and um, VOCs uh, <clears throat> and chemicals do they have with them that may be emitting into the air. Uh, biophilia, we're certainly seeing more and more uh, evidence and interest in this, uh, in this topic. So bringing in light and daylight sensors, uh, access to views, 
plants and elements of nature that really help to bring the outdoors in, especially as we spend so much time indoors. And then uh, movement as well is a key component and just integrating components of active design within the built environment and within your space. And so whether that's um, you know, ergonomic equipment, having areas where there's opportunity for movement, highlighting stairways over elevators, um, to really just create more of an engaging and collaborative space and, and diverse space as that. At that. <clears throat> I'd also add acoustics here as well um, and a number of other components, but there's, here's just a few areas of opportunity that we see to really um, address and integrate health and well-being in, into a building space. Interestingly enough that um, as much as there are these areas of opportunity, they're not quantified during the design process and are really communicated during the design process. And so there's a lot of focus around energy and water savings and what sort of utility and maintenance cost savings can, um, can arise from building design, but not as much on these areas of opportunity that I was just mentioning. So, um, or actually the occupant benefits that come with it or the brand equity or increase in uh, talent attraction and retention and so forth. And so, this is actually where there's real opportunity with substantial return, and we'll be getting into more of that as I move along here. <clears throat> I wanted to just take a step back uh, and, and talk about the imbalance of spending versus actual impact. And it's interesting to look at what actually influences our health. Um, and this is from a few years ago during the Obama administration, so things may have shifted a little bit, but um, we spent 85% of our US health expenditure on providing access to health treatment. And so that's certainly the, the majority of our funds are spent in that way. But when you actually look at what influences health, um, there's a real disproportion. So only 10% is related to access, whereas 20% is related to environment and 50% is related to healthy behavior. And so you can see the imbalance there is what we're, at, we're focusing our money on and what is actually impacting our health and well-being is, um, is not aligned. But it can be a real, really empowering opportunity for the AC community because it demonstrates that through design and certain decisions that we make, uh, we have the ability to influence people's health by creating spaces that promote healthy behavior and are healthy environments. And so really addressing that 70% there. Um, and this is also a great opportunity because we spend so much of our time in buildings, over 90% of our time within the indoors. Um, if we can design spaces that are healthy for us and foster healthy behaviors, we can really see some great benefits. And there's quite a bit of research that's correlating these key design elements and areas of opportunity and, and how it's affecting occupants. Um, this chart is a, a compilation of studies collected by Carnegie Mellon and their building investment designs, uh, excuse me, decision support for Green Building Technologies Group. Uh, and you can see that there's just this growing, um, growing research and evidence on how these design elements are affecting occupants. And so it's color coded here to identify the different areas of opportunity. So the indoor air quality, which we're well familiar with, is just increasing as the years go on, as well as thermal comfort, lighting and daylighting, um, noise and acoustics, views and biophilia, ergonomics, and location access to amenities. And so there's upwards of 400 industry and academic studies that are focusing on the indoor environment uh, and its impact on health and performance. And actually from these 400 studies, Stoke combed through to find the ones that we really felt were the most robust and we could stand behind the science and approach and utilize these studies to um, develop our financial case, which I'll be going into further um, as we move along here. One reputable research study um, that some of y'all may be familiar with is from 2015 Harvard Cognitive Study, and this looked at the impacts of indoor environment on cognitive function. So it looked at subjects that were in controlled rooms with varying levels of CO2, ventilation rates, and VOC levels, uh, and there were three different groups, so a conventional indoor environment group, green indoor environment group, and a green plus indoor environment. And the subjects were each asked to complete their normal work tasks and take a strategic management simulation test that was ultimately designed to test the effectiveness of their high order decision making through nine different cognitive functions. So each of those functions are on the graph here. 
and then all, and actually in all forms of the cognitive function, the Green Plus environments scored higher than the conventional. So Green Plus included uh, low levels of CO2, VOCs, and other toxins, as well as thermally comfortable space and fresh ventilation and good lighting. Um, and interestingly enough, there was actually a follow-up study done that looked at the impacts of the indoor environment or of these spaces after the occupants left and um, found that over, I think it was, yeah, the sleep quality scores were 6.4% higher for participants in the green certified spaces over the conventional, which just demonstrates that the buildings are continuing to impact us even after we leave, uh, which shows there's, yeah, there's even more impact than, um, than just, you know, our nine to five if it's our workspace, but it certainly impacts us uh, in the after hours as well. And the industry has really responded to this growing awareness. So the previous section, what I was just talking about was mostly academic work or companies partnering with academic research. Um, it's received a lot of attention and, and really helped to push the industry forward and, um, and broaden the communities that are getting access and exposure to this information. And over time, there's been both public and private institutions and developments that have recognized the impacts of the indoor environment and it's causing it to really be more widely recognized and other tools and resources to be developed like various green building rating systems or high performance building rating systems like your living building challenge or lead well, reset, fit well, a number of um, tools that are helping to support project teams implement and understand how these different design strategies can support occupant health and well-being in the space. So we recognize the value, but it's interesting to think about um, where is the value and how does it relate to each individual stakeholder and how does it differ across those stakeholders. So when we're thinking about the built environment and high performance buildings, um, and from the developer perspective, it's, you know, why would I want to build this high performing, build it, high performing building? Yet from the landlord and property manager, it's why would I want to own it? And then from the tenant, why would I want to lease this high performance building? And these next couple graphics are from the World Green Building Council uh, and just demonstrate a, <clears throat> a good image and, and questions in terms of where, where is the value for these particular players. So from the developer or owner, it's thinking about, you know, these high performance buildings can offer a higher resale value, higher rent premium, really being competitive in the market, faster leasing and so forth. And then the landlord and property manager, um, the value is certainly around the health and well-being and that increased marketability, which we're seeing daily, um, how much that is uh, really rising in the market and, and <clears throat> becoming really an expectation, it seems. Uh, also, lower vacancy rates, uh, an increased corporate image and prestige, and lower transaction fees. And then last but not least is where's the value for the tenant. And I want to focus particularly on the the center of the bubble here, that increased employee retention, employee health and, well, and wellness, and productivity. Um, this is actually where Stoke really dug into identifying the business case, and I'll be talking about that as we move through here. Um, but those three benefits really have a pretty significant impact into the bottom line. So as we you know, are looking at tenants and occupants in the space, it's interesting to think about how our economy and our companies are valued and how that's shifted over the last number of decades. We really moved from a manufacturing and industrial nation to a service-based economy. And so in you know, the 1970s, we were valuing our businesses and our companies on our equipment and our tangible assets, whereas today we're much more focused on um, our people and their ideas and the intellectual capital within the buildings and within the companies. And so a good question to ask is, you know, how are our budgets supporting this? How are our budgets supporting our people? and how do we create spaces to support productive, healthy, and happy people and their ideas to ultimately deliver the best value to the company. And wellness as a business strategy to me is just you know, continuing on that theme that it's really um, taking care of the, the occupants and how this is benefiting uh, companies in the bottom line. There's several statistics on how a growing number of US employers are investing in health and wellness initiatives for employees. And there's an overwhelming majority of operational costs that goes towards personnel. And this lends opportunity for employers to invest in healthy and inviting spaces, which leads to really significant ROI through worker engagement, productivity, and health and happiness.
And so not only do we want to take care of our occupants because they're a majority of the value of businesses, but there's also the 110, 100, 1000 story, which I'm not sure if you're familiar with or not, but a, a new way to look at cost. And so it's, this is, talks about a typical company life cycle expenditure um, and comparison here. So a typical building has four major elements of cost throughout its life, the design, the construction, operations, and employees. And every dollar spent in design is equivalent to $10 in construction, $100 in operations, and $1,000 in your employees. So the cost of employees is a thousand times the cost of designing the building or space they'll occupy, which is certainly significant. So in other words, increasing design and construction costs by 10% to ultimately mitigate a 1% employee cost or increase the productivity by 1% is certainly a smart investment. There may be some hesitation to, to do that you know, at first glance, but when you think about how that rolls out and the impact and the potential that it has, it um, certainly makes financial sense. And so all this information and data and research um, led Stoke to digging into quantifying the financial case for high performance buildings and how can we really quantify what these benefits are. And so we developed a methodology on how to integrate and put a dollar number to some of these tougher items to quantify, so such as productivity, retention, and wellness. So all these areas of opportunity and design strategies that research has shown that it um, you know, improves the components, we haven't been able to put a number around, whereas we have been able to put a number around the you know, energy and water savings and utility and maintenance costs and so forth. So this was our uh, attempt to do that. So we used a discounted cash flow methodology and analyzed a multitude of, of research studies, as I mentioned, from that 400 from Carnegie Mellon Group, um, pared that down to 60 that felt really robust um, and demonstrated the impact of, of high performance buildings. Uh, and then we developed an industry average based hypothetical building and company that had the characteristics listed on the right hand side here. So 150,000 square foot building, 183 square foot per person, which is about average office space uh, per individual these days, 820 employee, which results in 820 employees. And then this company, um, average revenue per employee is $540,000, the fully burdened employee salary of $100,000, working 265 days a year and 10% profit margin. Um, I just mentioned all these statistics and, and characteristics here because this is used consistently throughout our calculations to um, roll out the overall benefit for each of the different items that we'll be discussing. I will say too that we also integrated a $20 per square foot cost premium for all net present value calculations for the um, high performance building uh, design. And I want to just take a quick step back and ensure we define what makes a high performance building. So. Um, as defined by the National Institute of Building Sciences High Performance Building Council, these buildings address human, environmental, economic, and total societal impact, and ultimately the result of the application of the highest level of design, construction, operation, and maintenance principles. Truly uh, a paradigm shift and change for the built environment. So again, the five components are enhancing the occupant experience and improving health and wellness, optimizing resource efficiency, minimizing environmental impacts from design to demolition, increasing and embedded resiliency, and delivering a higher financial return than traditional buildings of the same use type. So now we can get into uh, the numbers and calculations. So our research again focused on three components, the productivity, retention, and health, and how these um, benefits impacted the occupant, or how, excuse me, how, how performance buildings strategies uh, and design resulted in increased productivity, retention, and health for the employees. And so we'll start with the enhanced productivity. The productivity increases uh, from the research really range from one to 50%. So it's kind of all over the place. And how they me uh, measure productivity will really vary. And our approach throughout all this is to, to take a conservative approach. The typical range was 8 to 15, um, so we actually utilized just a 3% productivity enhancement. Um, we can't quite prove that a 1% increase in productivity equals a 1% increase in revenue, but there's certainly a correlation, and that's also why we kind of kept on the lower end with that 3% productivity enhancement. 
rather than upwards of you know even eight or 15, which was the typical range. So we have $540,000 of the average annual revenue per employee. And due to high performance building design, um, proposing 3% productivity enhancement, which results in $16,200 increase of revenue gain per employee. We have that 10% profit margin, which results in $1,620 profit per employee. Now, if you recall, there's 820 employees in our hypothetical company. So on a per company basis, it results in $1.33 million or 3% annual profit due to that productivity enhancement of 3% in high performance buildings. So pretty substantial. The increase in retention is our next um, component that I wanted to talk about. And the separation rate is what we're using to quantify the retention impacts for this report. Uh, the separation we're defining as um, a voluntary leave or, or somebody quitting. And the Bureau of Labor Statistics says that the average separation rate is currently 34% for a company um, per year, which is, I, I was surprised at that. Um, pretty amazing. Uh, and the cost of separation can range from 90 to 200% of an employee's salary. So really a significant cost because it's, you know, 34% is the average rate and then 90 to 200% is the uh, of an employee's salary is the cost. Again, we take a conservative approach. Uh, so we're utilizing the 90% lower end of that employee's salary range. And the cost really comes from that transition. Uh, so HR cost, manager's time, temporary coverage, training and orientation, um, low office morale, you know, the multitude of things that are listed here. And, um, and I'm sure if any of you have been through this, you know that uh, it certainly it costs quite a bit and requires a lot of resources. So by incorporating um, high performance building design strategies and utilizing this, um, this approach, you know, these spaces, people feel engaged, um, productive, cared for, valued, and research states that there can be a reduction in the separation rate. And so um, the statistics that we use is a 5% reduction in separation rate. And so the calculations I'll run through here. So if we have $100,000 average employee salary, and we're utilizing that 90% estimated cost of separation, and the 34% average separation rate at first, uh, results in $30,600 of the retention cost per employee. If we reduce that separation rate by 5%, so now it's 29% uh, separation rate rather than that 34 due to the high performance building design, results in $1,530 cost savings per employee. Again, we have that 820 employees per company, and so it results in 1.25 million or 2.83% annual, uh, annual profit due to that increased retention. And the next component we'll look at is the improved health benefit. And so this, I think, what the, um, we're most perhaps familiar with with high performance building design strategies um, is really creating a, a healthy uh, and well space for the occupants. And so research states that we could have um, a 30% annual reduction in the average of four sick days, which results in 1.2 more days at work for each employee. So if the average revenue per employee per day is to about $2,000, if we increase their, uh, their days at work by 1.2 or reduce their, annual, their sick days by 30%, that's $2,446 of average revenue gain per employee. And then we add the 10% uh, profit margin, it results in $245 profit per employee increase to the company. And then we have that 820 employees at the company which results in $201,000 or close to 5%, 0.5% annual profit due to that absenteeism reduction of 30% due to the high performance building strategies. So how does the impact on the productivity, retention, and health all add up? Pretty significantly. So if we look at this on a per employee basis, again, we've got that 1.33 million annual profit increase due to the enhanced productivity of 3%, the $1.25 million increase annual profit uh, due to the increased retention, so reducing the separation by 
And then the 201,000 annual profit increase due to the reduced absenteeism by 30%. So that 1.2 more days at work. And that's all on a per employee basis. And so we look at it uh, for the entire company, it results in 2.78 million or over 6% annual profit due to investing in high performance buildings. Again, pretty astounding numbers here. This slide here demonstrates an occupier summary from two different perspectives, kind of depending on how your mind works and who you're working with um, and how you want to communicate the results. But the one on the left is on a per employee basis and the one on the right is on a per square foot basis. We've added in the utility and maintenance savings and also applied that $20 per square foot cost premium for the high performance buildings. And overall, the summary demonstrates the total net present value over 10 years of $24,000 per employee or $129 per square foot. And each color along the circle here represents a different benefit. And you can clearly see that the most value comes from the enhanced productivity and the increased retention. And as mentioned earlier, we don't know the exact relationship between the productivity and the revenue, um, but there's certainly a case for, for positive return. And interestingly enough, you know, the utility savings and the maintenance savings seems to be the most well-known and most communicated um, benefit or element, but it actually takes up less than 10% of the total value. So it doesn't necessarily mean that the utility maintenance savings aren't worth the benefit, they certainly are, but it just demonstrates that about 90% of the value of high performance buildings is not being discussed. And all research around the increase of cost for high performance buildings or net zero energy buildings or living building challenge is about 18 to $20 per square foot. So year one, it, can, uh, it actually can all pay back due to the increased benefits to the employees. So we know it'll come back and decrease utility and maintenance, but also increase employee productivity, retention, and health. And so the real encouragement here is to change our, our thinking from the first cost thinking to opportunity cost thinking, and to really think beyond solar panels and water saving fixtures and durable sustainably sourced materials, which are all key elements to, um, to good design. Uh, but to really think about how high performance buildings can do more um, than save on operating costs. And these next generation buildings, to really consider wider impacts on the space on the occupant. And the research can't be ignored anymore. It's this great design is, is really centered on the human experience and, and definitely has this significant payback. And so that uh, is the overview of, of our report. Um, we certainly have some time for questions here and um, there's a report download link on this slide here. And I will say too that Stoke is exploring um, developing a similar resource from the developer and investor perspective. We're still trying to figure out what that looks like. Um, but this report is focused on the tenant occupant perspective, but understanding too that um, this information can be valuable looking at it for other stakeholders as well. You so definitely. thank you all for attending. Thank you, Devin. That was such an interesting talk. It's, I'm so happy to see somebody put numbers to things that we, some of us already know, and you can measure it. Um, I have some questions for you. The first one is, when looking at cost for employees in comparison with the cost of design, what is the time frame considered for the employees? And wouldn't that number be higher over a 30-year life of the building? Sure. Um, you know, that's a good question. I'll have to look into that further, and um, if whoever asked that could email me, I could get back to them on that. Okay. we Will do. And I'm just reminding everybody to please send your tips to me, Holly Harris, privately, and I'm happy to ask Devin for you. Um, Devin, what is the biggest barrier to implementing high-performance buildings? I would say um, tenant education would be the, the biggest barrier because it seems like once we have this information at our fingertips, we're able to um, really understand the bigger picture. Uh, but it's sort of that, that hesitation or fear for investment um, that, that limits really going for it. 
but it feels like that there's more and more research out there um, that's demonstrating that the high performance buildings is a benefit. Where do you see greater traction for high performance buildings, demand from the tenants or delivery by the investor? I would say um, we really need both. I think that if the tenants are demanding it, then the speculative you know, developer investor will respond, but um, it's almost, I, I think that there really needs to, to be both. And then how do you really convince these investors or developers to deliver high performance buildings? Mm -hmm. uh, I would say c case studies and just more and more research and information um, that we can provide can demonstrate the case. I have a couple more questions here. What are the necessary steps to effectively design and implement high performance buildings? Uh, I think first and foremost is really to identify the goals early on and have all the stakeholders at the table um, and really understand what the needs of the, of the space and the occupants are um, and really to design with all the stakeholders involved. Uh, last question I have here in case there are other ones out there. How have you helped inform your clients and bring health and wellness into a project? Um, I think, again, kind of going off the last one is really trying to identify the goals up front and having these conversations first and foremost and, and really looking at, um, you know, a school's goals and opportunities will look different than an office, which will look different than a hospital or a community center and so forth. And so really understanding um, the needs of, of the occupants there and then utilizing different resources or research or rating systems to track these goals and integrate strategies. Uh, we've also worked with manufacturers to identify products that meet the material health goals. Um, yeah, I think um, certainly the material health and product health uh, has been a key component to a lot of projects lately. And so utilizing things like the Living Building Challenge um, Red List and using that as a resource to ensure that the indoor environment is healthy as it can be. Great. Thank you so much. Um, well, I have found this to be very fascinating, and I hope that there are more people that will take advantage of what you have to say here and will have more high-performance buildings in the future. Um, so with that, I'll thank you for your wonderful presentation and encourage everybody to tune back in the fall when we'll have another of our Brown Bag webinar series. So thank you, Devin, and if people have questions for her, please you can email her there at devin at .com. So with that, I'll end this webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sure. Thanks, all.